Yes, it is. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Hello and um, welcome to today's Be Healthy webinar. Today we're going to talk about gambling and um, COVID and support that's available to the communities that you're working with. Um, I have, again, a really good lineup of um, speakers here who will share their expertise and knowledge with you all. So we have Professor um, Jim Orford, Rob Burkett and Andrea Neville, who will all um, provide different aspects throughout the webinar and we'll introduce them all separately as we come to them. So um, before we um, move on to the actual content, just a little bit of housekeeping um, and um, then we'll move on to talk about Be Healthy. So in, house uh, in housekeeping terms, um, when you're not speaking, if you could stay muted and turn your camera off, just helps with the smooth running and the bandwidth. Also, if you have a VPN, maybe NetMotion or Cisco on your computer, it's probably what you use to connect to your work um, network. Also turn that off as well, it helps too. Um, whilst I've asked you to turn your microphones and videos off if you're not talking, we do welcome questions. So if there's anything on your mind or you've got a question, use the chat function um, to pop your question in. Equally, if you wouldn't like to raise a question in front of everybody else, you can email us at the Healthy Brum email address. Um, we will pick that question up and if we need to get input and a response, we will do that for you. Um, Lastly, on the housekeeping front, as we've already said, um, today's webinar um, is recorded and um, we are using them as resources. So they're available on the Healthy Brum YouTube channel and linked from the um, Birmingham City Council website where you would have booked this webinar. Um, so I think that's all on the housekeeping and I'm looking to someone to move the slides, but I have the power. <laughs> um, OK, on to talking about be healthy and why be healthy. Um, be Healthy is a series of practical, hopefully practical resources that can help people that work with communities um, to help them improve their health and reduce the risk of them becoming seriously ill from COVID-19. Um, there's the webinar series that I've already mentioned, um, but also we have a, a resource that can be downloaded for you to use with communities or with your families or individuals or as individuals even. Um, the resource it includes a checklist to a healthier you and um, a plan to help you get change habits and, and get ready. Um, it's also got COVID safe information on the back as well. And it's available to download in uh, 20 languages from the website too. So hopefully it should, should reach the target, the communities you're trying to talk, work with. Um, in terms of the webinars, we've had a real range of topics. So we started off with COVID safety. So things like hand washing, how to access tests, we then ran through some long-term conditions that are particularly linked to COVID and how to, how to maintain your health with those. And, we then, and we've looked at a series of um, webinars to look at um, getting your mind ready and then um, healthy habits that we would like to encourage people to do more of, such as being more active, eating more healthily. And then some of those things that people's health would, could improve if they, if they reduce doing a little bit and gambling falls into that category. Um, so I think without... Um, Further ado, let's move on to the actual um, content of today's webinar. So um, I'm going to introduce Jim Orford. Um, he's going to talk to us about gambling and COVID and, and recognising why it is such a big public health problem. So, um, Jim, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. Um, it is Jim Orford, by the way, although I think if a name appears, it looks as if it's my wife's name, Judith, but it, it really is Jim here. So I'm very pleased to be here. I'm just in, in the 10 minutes that's available to me. Uh, I'm going to touch on a number of issues that I think are important, really about the background to do with, with, with gambling. Um, and uh, if there's a if there's a theme to what what I'm saying, I think it is about change and about the incredible amount of change there's been to do with gambling over the last, I suppose, 25 years and how that change is continuing right up to the present time, including, of course, the, the effect of the of the covid uh, pandemic. Um, so if I can have the first the first of the slides, please. Um, one of the things that's happened over the last the last several years is that gambling, the very forms of gambling have changed and expanded. Um, 
they vary. I've just put up some examples there, but you can still bet on horses. You can still bet on dog races. You can still play bingo, some of the traditional forms of, of, of gambling. Um, but new things have come on. Um, the people will remember the fixed odds betting terminals. These, these were really bringing casino type games onto machines in high street betting shops. So that was, that was relatively new. There's a lot more poker, poker tournaments, poker clubs than there were spread betting. And of course the big one is online gambling. Um, so now online gambling has really overtaken everything else as the, the biggest single sector of, uh, of, of gambling in terms of uh, money spent and money, money lost. So we've still got the old forms of gambling. We've got new ones. Um, there's some of the new forms are fast and, and furious. They've got even greater addiction potential. Um, and potential for harm than some of the some of the the previous more more traditional forms. So that's the first thing. Um, the next slide, um, really, I just wanted to show on this slide the the, the way in which the commercial uh, gambling industry has taken advantage of some of the changes that have happened. So the big change was the two thousand and five gambling act brought in by the new Labour government of, of the time, which really changed the way we were supposed to think uh, about gambling. And I think what the government at the time didn't appreciate was just the fact that gambling has always been dangerous. I think they neglected the history. Um, British history is full of evidence that, that gambling has always been dangerous. And of course, they couldn't have predicted or perhaps they could have predicted, but they didn't predict um, online gambling and how enormous that was going to be and how dangerous that was going to become. So what I've shown on this slide is just some of the ways in which the commercial gambling industry is using various tricks of its trade to get people to uh, gamble, to stay gambling, to gamble more, uh, and to be, as far as they're concerned, good customers. Um, some of these what I've called tricks of the trade, really verge on something that is, although it may be legal, is really nearly fraudulent. Um, I, the very last one on that list, the free bets and bonuses, whenever you see gambling advertised, you'll often see free, free bets advertised, you know, sign up with us and bet and we'll give you £10 free, we'll give you £20 free to, to gamble with. This really is, is not honest uh, in the sense that people find they actually have to gamble quite a lot in order to uh, get the free 10 pounds or, or 20 pounds. Um, winning is emphasized. A lot of these particular tricks of the trade, as I, as I call it, are ways of making out that you're actually winning uh, when really you're losing. There's a thing called return to player. Um, in this country, one's, you're required to, to say as a promoter of gambling, what your return to player is. So, but people really don't understand that. If you're, if you're told there's a 95% return to player, what does that mean? Does that mean that you're gonna win 95% of the, of the time? It's, it's actually extremely mis misleading. So if I can have the next slide, um, the whole changing face of gambling over the last quarter of a century, and particularly since the 2005 Gambling Act, has meant that gambling is really uh, much more in our faces in terms of uh, much more advertising. Really, gambling advertising on the whole wasn't allowed until the National Lottery um, came on stream in the 1990s. And since then, advertising, as I think we all realise now, um, has gone up absolutely enormously and people are seeing an awful lot of gambling advertising and children who um, who should be protected under our regulations are seeing a great deal of advertising as well and the the estimates are the gambling commission i don't know if rob will say more about this or not but um the the estimates now that something like a third of adults in this country have in any 12-month period um a definite gambling problem and probably another 
at least half uh, a million who are getting on that way because they're gambling in a in a particularly risky a risky way and i think the gambling commission estimates that there's something like 55,000 or thereabouts rough estimate obviously under 16s who have a gambling a gambling problem so this has become uh, a big public health problem and those numbers are not terribly different from the prevalence of problems related to use of illicit drugs in Britain. So this is a huge public health problem. If I can have the next, the next slide, please. Um, this just depicts some of the, the forms of harm from, from gambling. I don't want to go into this in, in great detail because I think this may be the subject of what Rob is, is, is going to say in a minute. So I won't go into this in detail, except to make the point that because harm from gambling comes up in so many different ways, there are so many people in different service positions in any community who ought to know about gambling. Um, people who have anything to do with finances, people who are in the business of money, money advice, money management, debt management should know about gambling. Um, people involved in homelessness services should know, people in mental health services should certainly know. Um, and they're broader effects as well on the family and in, in and on society. Um, inequality is, is, is one of them. Contribution of gambling, and undoubtedly gambling makes a contribution to, to rising inequality. Um, if I can go on to the next slide, the one, one of my particular interests and the interests of the, the research group that I've been uh, uh, connected with is about the effect on families, uh, affected family members. And this particular review, I just mentioned a good review that was carried out some, some years ago, broke down the effects on the family into three types, um, financial effects. And these can be colossal for families. Um, they really can. Relationships affected, much in the same way as other addiction, addiction and, and appetitive problems uh, can. Um, and then the health of affected family members. This is a the affected family members affected by the gambling of someone in your family, um, this itself um, is a major risk uh, for, for health. Um, and if I can quickly go on to the next, the next slide. I mean, this, for example, is just some of the things that wives of, of people with gambling problems say. Um, and uh, I mean, I could talk all day about this because it's it's something that we, our group's been particularly interested in. But I'll, I'll just leave you to look at that for a second. Um, and the next slide just says something about children, um, children being particularly vulnerable. Um, children where there's a gambling problem in one of the adults in the family often talk about being caught in the middle of things. They hear rows going on. Um, they themselves feel the neglect of, you know, an adult promising to be there but not being there and feeling a whole range of, of feelings, feeling angry, feeling hurt, feeling confused, and often, of course, feeling ashamed. And as children uh, sadly often do when there's, there's an adult problem like this, feeling, uh, feeling maybe they're to blame in some way. Um, the next slide I wanted to, to show is about an organization that started up in the couple, last couple of years and has been very effective in calling attention to uh, problems related to gambling in the family and particularly to suicide. And what, what that shows is actually a number of young men, all I think in their, in their 20s, 30s, yeah, one or two dipping into their 30s, all of whom have committed suicide. Um, having had gambling problems. And it's Jack's parents, Jack, the one on the left, it's Jack's parents, um, um, Charles and Liz Ritchie, who've started this organization, Gambling With Lives, which as I say, has been very effective and, and getting people to really take seriously the idea that experts by experience, people who actually have been through it as family members or people who've had gambling problems themselves, should be involved in helping us formulate how we respond to gambling problems. Uh, the next slide, just again, briefly to touch on the big question of, well, how can one help people with gambling disorder, as it's, it's now being called in some quarters? Um, and I've just depicted some of the things from cognitive behavior therapy. Gamblers Anonymous has been around for a very long time. It's got a lot of experience. Um, 
good treatments range from those brief advice, comparatively brief and quick, quick advice can be helpful right through to residential support. Um, I think a couple, a couple of just general points I want to make. One is that we just haven't had enough treatment. Uh, it's a, it's something that's been neglected. So unfortunately, service providers and others um, haven't known enough about gambling or what to do about it, where to refer people to, how to how to respond. And the second thing is that the NHS has has really taken very much a back seat up to now. That's changing. There's been one special clinic for a number of years in London. There's another one recently opened in Leeds to serve to serve areas in the north of England. And the NHS has promised, I think, up to sort of 10 or a dozen special N NHS gambling clinics over the next uh, few years. Well, we'll wait and we'll wait and see. Um, I'll skip the next slide and I'll just go straight on to the next one, which is of particular interest to me because uh, it depicts in diagrammatic form something called the five step method, which is a method that we've, our group has devised and is now being used in a number of countries around the world um, for helping family members, affected family members in their own right. And I think it's important to realize that the percentage of people who we think could benefit um, themselves from some sort of treatment or advice about their own gambling, the proportion you're actually getting it is been estimated at somewhere between five and 10%. So in other words, the majority of family members who are coping uh, with something in the, in the family, a gambling problem in the family, are not uh, in touch with someone who is themselves in touch with treatment. So it's really important, any service that, that runs a service for gambling problems must also be providing a service for affected family members um, in their own right. Uh, and if I can have the next one, just coming to the end, um, there are reasons to be cheerful about uh, about things. There've been the the government has uh, promised us, uh, and we're waiting with bated breath uh, from day to day and week to week. They've promised a review of the existing legislation, the 2005 Gambling Act, which. I think all the major political parties uh, at the last election admitted is really not fit for purpose. It can't cope with online gambling. It can't cope with the changing face of gambling we've seen since since the 2005 Act was was passed. And in anticipation of uh, the review that the government had promised of the legislation, there have been several really good reports. There's been an all-party parliamentary group on gambling-related harms that's reported. The House of Lords has had a select committee they've reported. The Social Market Foundation have had a particularly interesting report. Public Health England are uh, undertaking a review at the moment. Um, and the government review is expected any any time. And the extraordinary thing is really the and this is coming back to my my theme of change that the, all the these those first three reports there um, have suggested very very significant change to what to what goes on. They really are saying the regulation has not been tight enough. Um, they want to see the onus. Um, for proving that a, a form of gambling is safe to be put on the, the gambling providers. Whereas what we've had in the last few years really is the, the onus being put on those of us in the public health field who think that something may not be, be safe. The fixed odds betting terms was a very good example. It took years really, um, long past the time when most people recognized that that form of gambling with high stakes was particularly addictive. It took years. That's got to change. The funding of research, which currently comes from the gambling industry, that's got to change. Advertising has got to change. They're all saying that we shouldn't have so much advertising around football matches, for example. All the footballers that one sees on match of the day carrying an advert for gambling on their on their shirts. And indeed, the all party parliamentary group are saying that actually gambling is not something that should be advertised at all. Uh, a rather extraordinary and radical statement. So we've got some very radical reports. We're waiting for the uh, government to, to set up its, its review. So I think we can look forward to some very significant change um, over the next uh, few months and years. I hope so. And if I can just skip the next slide and just move 
to that one. There are some references. There's a reference to my book um, that, that I wrote and which came out at the end of last, last year. Excellent book by Rebecca Cassidy, an anthropologist, who's, if you want to know about the tricks, you know, the tricks that the commercial gambling industry are pulling on people, um, read Rebecca Cassidy's book. It's excellent. Um, the Sulkanen book is an international about what's going on internationally. The Justin Larkin book is an excellent book by a man who's had a gambling problem himself. And Liz Carter's book is a, is on, based on experience of treating women with, with gambling problems. So a bit of a rush through that. Very happy to answer any questions when we get to, when we get to the uh, question and answer session. So thanks very much. Thank you, Jim. That was great. Um, really interesting as well. Um, just overview of gambling and the changes of the gambling um, opportunity that exists now to um, 2005 when the act was brought in. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, next, we're going to move on to um, Rob Burkett, who's going to um, carry on. He's from the Gambling Commission and here with us now to take over. So over to you, Rob. Thank you. Rob, I think you're muted at the moment. Um, Rob, are you here with us at the moment? I can see you, but I'm not sure if you can. Yeah, I think your microphone's muted. Um, Just see if I can. At the bottom of your at the bottom of your screen, you I think yeah, there's no, a I'm yeah, fine. perfect. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Okay. No problem, over to you. Okay. Do you want me to move on to the next slide for you? Just hold on. I'm just sorry. It's okay. If you, at the top, I think there's a drop down to request control. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So yeah, I'm Rob Burkett from the Gambling Commission and um, hopefully you can all hear me. Firstly, to start with, thanks very much for Birmingham City Council setting this up. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can all hear you, don't worry, that's okay. fine. Okay, right. Well, firstly, congratulations to the City Council for setting this up anyway. I think it's a great initiative. Um, so I wanted to run through a few facts and figures really, which can be a little bit boring, but I thought it was useful to uh, do so. So, People may feel that gambling problems are, you know, something that is not known to them, that um, it's a tiny proportion of the people in GB. However, um, that first slide indicates that 0.7% of the population uh, are actually problem gamblers. So what do we mean by problem gamblers? We mean people whose lives have been severely affected by gambling, such as that they can't function normally. Um, it's disrupting their lives. Jim mentioned this earlier. Um, 
So it's having a disproportionate effect on their way to interact overall. And that figure is fairly consistent. But that's actually quite a large proportion of um, GB population. 2.4% um, low risk, 1.1% moderate risk. Moderate risk is people who whose lives are to some extent disrupted, but not majorly. So it may be that, for example, they miss a mortgage payment or a rent payment for one month, but nothing too awful. Um, another thing we know is that people who um, participate in multiple forms of gambling. So if they do some online gambling, if they do um, some, um, say, bingo or casino gambling and so on, they're more likely to be at risk. Um, another highlight there is, and this is very, very consistent, across all age ranges, men are much greater risk than women. Um, and then going to the, um, the bullet point, um, gambling participation, we know there are comorbidities between uh, gamblers and smokers and people who are drinking, drinking alcohol. There are a number of other comorbidities, um, and that includes the last bullet point, so those with possible mental health issues are also more likely to experience gambling harm. So even if the area that you work in is not to do with gambling. The risk is that drinking alcohol and smoking and mental ill health, there's likely to be a greater propensity to gambling harm. Next slide, please. Thanks. So another area to consider is around young people, and Jim referenced this earlier. And one concern actually is one that I have focused on um, to an extent, is young people and gambling. So one thing we know is that young people um, tend to pick up um, gambling inclinations from their parents. So there tends to be a generational issue. And um, of particular concern here is that, as you'll see at the bottom bullet point, 1.7% of 11 to 16 year olds are classified as problem gamblers which is just a massive proportion. And um, I instituted a piece of research working with local authorities um, about two years ago to look at young people playing um, what are called category C machines. That's the machines you find in alcohol licensed premises such as pubs and the failure rate for staff preventing young people playing those machines um, has been truly astonishing. So it was about, last time I looked, it was about 80% had failed that test. So we're particularly concerned about, you know, whether adequate measures are in place to prevent young people accessing gambling opportunities. So I'll leave those figures with you, but 
I think all of us should be concerned about young people's access to gambling opportunities. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and then one thing I wanted to mention was um, very often people think, oh, you know, well, gambling, I never hear about it. Um, you know, lots of voluntary organizations, um, lead workers, you know, um, well, nobody ever mentions it to me. But I think what we need to do is think about where drugs and alcohol were about 10 years ago. And that's just about where we are with gambling right now. And I hear that from frontline workers and treatment providers all the time. So it's still fairly hidden. Secondly, particularly in terms of the frontline workers you're in touch with, if they have alcohol and drugs issues, um, normally there won't be physical signs with gambling. There are with alcohol and drugs. Thirdly, there is a massive culture of stigma and embarrassment about, around gambling and feeling self-blame. And um, that really means that it's particularly well hidden. Lots of organizations I speak to say, uh, and this applies to local authorities as much as anybody else, uh, includes local councillors. Say, so, well, no, I never get a complaint about gambling. You know, I never hear about this. Um, no, you won't. You may get complaints about um, rowdy activity outside a pub or what have you. Nobody is going to turn to their local councillor um, to complain about gambling. They won't. And unless they explore, they'll never find out. Then why should I care? And Jim touched on this earlier. Um, so we know that around about between one uh, and six and one in 10 others are affected by gambling behavior. So the impact is much more serious than that of the individual who is suffering um, about gambling. Then in terms of what the Gambling Commission's doing, and I've got a rather long list, but I'll only stick it to one or two things. So for example, um, these are just one or two things. We've been working with the financial sector, such as the banks, um, to make sure that they have blocking mechanisms in place um, should a customer wish to stop spending on gambling. Uh, recently, we stopped what was called the VIP scheme, which is a very important person scheme, whereby uh, gambling operators uh, were inciting people to gamble when they'd gambled an awful lot of money. We've been recently working with Facebook around the gambling adverts issue. We have banned credit card payments on gambling. Uh, we've also, um, as you may have seen, issued very heavy fines and regulatory settlements on operators who are breaching the terms of their license. And we've also introduced self-exclusion schemes, both for online, that's remote, and offline, that is in shops, um, so that if people wish to self-exclude, um, 
there is means to do it and make sure that that works. In terms of what should I do, um, the important thing here in the West Midlands and in Birmingham is that we have people who can offer free training and support to frontline staff um, so that they're trained up to offer that kind of information that they need so that your clientele, as it were, your customers, call it what you will, um, have the right advice and guidance that they need. Last slide, please. Okay, so I'm just gonna finish with this one. Sorry, it'll just take one minute. But if I just take, hopefully you can all see that all right. Just to give you a wee bit, right of um if we follow one of those themes which is the financial one which is on the right hand side of your scheme uh, of your screen right so what tends to happen in that financial space is that people will start by borrowing from their nearest and dearest, their mates and what have you. And I'll say, oh, could I borrow 50 quid? You know, that kind of thing. Then eventually they're not paying it back because their gambling has grown to such an extent that it doesn't work. Next thing that happens is that all those people refuse to lend them any more money. So they go to a payday loan shop or something like that. And they can sustain that for a wee while. And of course that then becomes unsustainable. Then they turn to loan sharks and the like, or try and remortgage the house without their partner knowing and then they get themselves involved in criminality. And in each area of that particular picture that you can see, that escalation happens. And um, it's only very late in the day that people Knowledge to both themselves and to their nearest and dearest that that is what has happened. But I think that gives you hopefully a clear um, picture of how the situation um, escalates without the appropriate level of support and guidance earlier on. Okay. And I think that's all I'm going to say because I've spoken too long. But anyway, there we are. Happy Thank to you. Questions. Thank you, Rob. That was great. And a really interesting um, diagram to finish on that kind of encompasses everything really that's been talked about today. So I think that's something that's quite good to see it all on one, one slide together at the end there. So thank you. OK. Um, There's a couple of extra slides there that you'll be able to see when. Yeah. We... Oh, I don't know what's going on there. A couple of extra slides that will be there when, when, when you see the, the presentation at the end as well. So thank you for that. And then moving on now to um, Andrea Neville, who's with us from Aquarius. So she's going to talk about some of the local, oops, some of the um, services that are available to um, support um, gambling during COVID and, and how Aquarius have been responding during the pandemic. Are you, am I doing your slides for you, Andrea? Yes, if, if yeah. you're okay with that. Yeah, that's fine. I'll just go back to the beginning. Right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Brilliant. you. Brilliant. Thanks. So hello, everybody. And I'm Andrea from Aquarius. Um, and we are a gambling service in the Midlands. Um, and I'm working with clients every day to help them overcome problem gambling and also supporting their families. 
And uh, so who are we? <laughs> uh, we are a Midlands-based charity with over 40 years of experience supporting individuals um, and their families, which is, as Jim pointed out, so important that there is support not only for the, the problem gambler, but also their families. We also support organisations and communities to overcome the physical, emotional and psychological harms which are caused by alcohol, drugs and gambling. And we are a proud partner of GAMCARE. So the good news for Birmingham is, is that you have a treatment provider on your doorstep. Um, next slide, please. So as we've already heard, um, the impacts of problem gambling um, are, are well known. Um, these have now been heightened, I would say, during the pandemic. And, you know, they, they can be detrimental to a person's mental and physical health alongside their finances, relationships, employment and education. And then if that all of that isn't enough to try and handle, people had to try and handle having a, a gambling problem during a pandemic where they were dealing with the lockdown and for some losing their jobs or being on furlough, which would be a stressful time for anyone, but it made even more um, polarised by uh, the pandemic. And the most common impacts um, we see of problem gambling was our stress, anxiety and depression, family difficulties, relationship breakdown, financial difficulties, uh, domestic violence and suicidal ideation, which again has been compounded by loneliness and isolation experienced during the lockdown. Next slide, please. So um, these stats reflect what we're seeing at Aquarius. And um, um, when we look at the, the YouGov research figures, it shows that online betting has increased by 40% compared to March 2019. And we can see that active players online have actually increased by 88%. So what we see there is that, um, you know, the, the real life betting events, which um, like the Premier League football and things like that, betting is down, but in, in an increase in slots um, particularly has risen by 25% and poker plays up by 53%, which is quite um, interesting to see how people have swapped out one for another. Um, and the next set of figures will be published in November, so it will be interesting to see um, how these have changed in that time. But these figures very much reflect the experience of Aquarius and how we've seen an increase in numbers. Uh, next slide, please. So the new trends during the pandemic, we have seen, um, and as the stats suggest, we would expect to see an increased number of callers to the helpline, um, an increase in clients expressing suicidal ideation and safeguarding concerns for practitioners around the client's mental health. Um, the number of affected others and family members uh, contacting the charity services has rose significant, significantly. Possibly um, from being at home more um, has raised awareness of problem gambling among family members. Um, so they may not have noticed before, you know, because when you've got routine and you're out at work and doing other things, they may not have noticed before. So that could be another reason why family members are now getting in touch more. We've also seen an increase in female callers to the helpline um, who are experiencing the negative effects of online, online particularly gambling. Next slide, please. Um, and as uh, both Rob and Jim um, mentioned, there is an increase in, in younger gamblers and we have seen um, the, an increase in younger callers to the helpline. And in response to this, GAMCARE have now got a designated um, experienced youth uh, counsellor team who are available to work with this client group um, and in particular, the links between online gaming, Xbox, PlayStation, etc., and gambling, as the two previous speakers have pointed out, that is definitely something that we are seeing on the increase as well. Uh, next slide, please. So how to access support? So directly by calling us at Aquarius, um, the number is there on the screen, or you can email gambling at aquarius.org.uk and you can request help that way. 
Um, they, we have a single point of contact person who would immediately assess um, the referral and assign the client then to a practitioner in their nearest area. Um, by contacting the GAMCARE helpline, which is seven days a week, 24 hours a day, um, the GAMCARE helpline facilitates the referral to the client's local, local network partner, which in the West Midlands is us, is Aquarius. And referrals can be made um, by the person themselves, by a relative, a friend, GP, citizen's advice, or any professional involved with the client care. And once we have consent uh, by the client to go ahead and, and contact them, we will do so. Next slide, please. Um, so having the helpline available 24 hours uh, by GAMCARE is an amazing asset to us because our uh, clients are supported even when we're, we're not open, they, they are. So whilst the referral is being picked up uh, by us, the network partner, GAMCARE will still be in contact with the person and can liaise with any other local agencies, whether that's housing or um, citizens advice or anything that, or any safeguarding or mental health concerns that the person may have. Um, and it also means we know we can rest easy knowing our clients are supported 24 hours a day. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the types of treatment um, that are offered, um, I mean, there's the National Gambling Helpline, as I've already mentioned, mentioned offering advice and support to anyone affected by gambling or gambling or a family member or friend. There's the netline service and web chat, which uh, young people really enjoy using as well. And it also gives that bit of anonymity where you can just, you know, ask questions via the web chat um, when people are in that pre-contemplative stage of, oh, have I got a problem? Not sure. But you can go on and ask the questions, which hopefully will help establish, um, you know, whether or not the person needs to take things further or just needs that brief intervention. Um, and for those who wish to enter into one-to-one -one inter interventions, um, and that's both the client and the family members, um, they will be um, uh, sent to us for that. So the interventions that we offer are um, individual therapy sessions, which are CBT based using um, interventions and strategies. Um, and that's for the problem gambler and their families. And this can be done over the phone. Um, or on Zoom, on um, Microsoft Teams, or face-to-face, -face, which currently we are doing at a two meter distance in something that is a walk-talk therapy, um, which has been really successful. Um, the next slide, please. So if a treatment referral for um, a residential treatment is required, we can also do that. And we can refer it also to the National Problem Gambling Clinic in London or Leeds or Gordon Moody for the residential rehabilitation. Next slide, please. So our response to COVID-19. Um, so we recognise that the difficulties faced by clients who now find themselves or did find themselves a lot more at home during the lockdown um, with no routine, bored, lonely, possibly um, on furlough um, and surrounded by temptation of online. Um, and our usual service had to be quickly adapted to meet these clients' needs. Um, and our service aims to turn lives around from problem gambling and gambling addiction. It relies on therapy and face-to-face -face interaction to do this. And once the pandemic hit, we were very quick to respond and to adapt our service to meet the needs of our clients. Uh, next slide, please. So we were very quick to set up our team working from home and enabled Zoom and Microsoft Teams, as I said. We recognise that confidentiality issues for clients um, may be a problem, so we address these and we offer a much more flexible approach to appointments, um, late evenings, early mornings, when other family members might not be around so that they can still have their sessions. The walk talk therapy that I mentioned previously has been really um, warmly um, welcomed and you know it was a swift response by us to carry on one to one sessions for those who were already in our service and who needed the sessions at a time when they needed them the most. 
and who maybe could not adapt to the online uh, working for whatever reasons. Um, and because at Aquarius, um, clients are at the heart of everything we do, so we were quick to respond to that. Um, and also we are piloting a women's group, which is currently taking place uh, via walk talk therapy as well, which um, I did the first one last Thursday, which was really good. And um, the feedback was that it was so beneficial and not only the, the power of walk talk and, and interventions, but the power of nature was fantastic too. So um, next slide, please. So yes, we've come to the end of our uh, of my little talk and thank you so much for listening to me. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be hanging around now. Thank you for that, Andrea. And Andrea, there's so um, much good information there. The statistics you mentioned at the beginning are alarming though. I'm sure everybody listening will, will, will think that. Um, it was really good to hear though that you've developed a specific resource for young adults and um, particularly linked to online gaming and things. So that, that's really interesting, I think. Um, but overall, the amount of support that's available for people and how quickly and how well your service has adapted during the pandemic is really, really good. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you to all our speakers today. Um, because I've been moving the slides, I haven't been jumping in and out of the chat box because it tends to send things crazy. So um, if anybody's got any questions, um, start typing now and I'll move the slides onto the um, like discussion question um, and then I'll have a look in the chat box, okay? Um, okay, so um, I guess because um, all of the work we're doing through Be Healthy is about supporting and enabling the communities you're working for. Um, this is kind of the, the angle we were, were, were looking at today. So um, how can you enable communities to have better self-awareness of the dangers of gambling? And also how can you reach them and encourage them to get support if they need it? So if you've got any thoughts on that or any of the other things that have been said today or any general points of observation that maybe you want to comment on or you think someone else might, might want to to comment on your thoughts as well, um, please do drop them in the chat now. Um, whilst people are doing that, I don't know if there's any thoughts or observations from the three speakers today that they would like to share with everybody. Um, if you do, you're very welcome to. Okay, I'll, um, I've opened the chat, but um, I'll leave it a few minutes and see if anything pops in. And in the meantime, we'll just carry on through the wrap up of the, uh, the webinar. Oh, I've clicked in the chat now so the slides won't move. So there's, again, I know there have been links to useful resources and books and reading throughout all of the presentations. There's some further ones here for everybody. Um, one of the things we've been mentioning in all of our um, webinars, which is, is really useful for this one as well, we at the uh, Public Health Team in Birmingham City Council are um, developing a network of um, Birmingham champions. Um, the idea being that we, there are people within the community that we can pass information to, correct information about, about COVID, about restrictions, or about support services available to them and people that they can reach and talk to. And so if there's anybody within the services or your networks that you're working with, or yourselves live in Birmingham and want to be one of these people, um, just sign up on the website by the link below. Um, we're really hopeful that this network will help us reach those communities that we can't reach ourselves. Um, and so far it's, it's showing really good signs that it's gonna do that. So it'd be a good way to chat channel information about support and advice and guidance as well um, over the next few months. So I think that just moves us on now to kind of the, the final wrapping up of the webinar. So like all the others, um, the information and the recording from this webinar will be available at the top link on the website. Um, you can also find them on the Healthy Broom YouTube channel um, directly. If you um, have any questions that you haven't asked today or you'd like any more support and guidance, if you drop us a gen general email to the Healthy Broom email address, um, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, so I think that just leaves me to say thank you very much to our three speakers today. Um, as we've said all through the webinar series, we can't do this without um, you guys. And actually, without your services and expertise, we wouldn't be able to tackle these issues or be aware of quite what's going on in the communities either. So thank you very much to you all. Um, and also a big thank you to the public health team behind the scenes who've been working on this for the last few weeks really hard. Obviously, they're not here on screen today, but yeah, thank you for their contributions too. So well, Thank you very much for uh, arranging it and, in, and inviting us all. It's been very... <laughs> Uh, very interesting to listen to the other talks, I must say. So thank, thanks very much. You're very welcome. Thank you. 
Um, and that well done. Great job to all. <laughs> Thank you. And um, that, that's all from, from us today. So um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll wrap up there. And yeah, if anyone wants to get in touch afterwards, um, please do drop us an email. Um, thank you very much, everybody, and um, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.